that mindset, thinking about uh, what to do, sort of what those action steps should be, uh, the board as a whole came up with a thought process of, of needing to provide some sort of tool or some sort of structure or guidance to help our members address the issues of structural racism that are specific, that were specific and unique to their daily lives and practice. Um, and so essentially our goal in coming to this project, uh, Dr. Shayanka, Dr. Minkoff and I, was to find a way to create some form of tool that would meet these three goals. Uh, to provide metrics uh, specific to disparity and equity, issue, and equity issues in community mental health, uh, to make sure that what we created extended beyond the very important realms of cultural competency and linguistic appropriateness to also include uh, structural inequity and its relevance to community mental health, and to promote a stepwise concrete quality improvement process that could be adapted for self-directed use in the community mental health setting. Uh, to, to say a little bit about that third goal, our mindset as uh, folks who in, in leadership roles in the community, but also on the front line, lines ourselves in community mental health process, uh, practice, uh, our thinking was that you know, busy, hectic community organizations, um, often with limited resources, um, we, something that we noticed in the field was, was organizations often looking to expensive consultants or resources like that to do this form of work. And so our hope was to really provide an easy stepwise tool that would help organizations to self-direct quality improvement uh, in the realm of addressing structural racism in community mental health. So to say a little bit about our process in terms of gathering the information to, uh, to devise this tool. Uh, this wasn't a formal research process per se, but our goal was essentially to draw on both the existing evidence base, as well as the sort of the lived experience and expertise of our membership working in the front lines in community mental health, as well as the expertise of our board. Um, and so sources that we drew on in terms of thinking about how to put this tool together included a town hall, a membership town hall for members of the American Association of Community Psychiatry, which included uh, hundreds of community psychiatrists across the country uh, in which uh, members were, uh, were uh, broken up into breakout groups to discuss their reflections on structural racism and their thoughts about ways in which the American Association for Community Psychiatry as, an, as a board and as a group could address these issues. And so while that town hall wasn't specifically intended just for this tool, that was certainly a rich source of information for us in thinking about how to put together such a quality improvement tool. Um, the American Association for Community Psychiatry board is divided into a few subcommittees that work on particular aspects of community leadership and work. And so two of those subcommittees, one that is primarily focused on creating concrete products uh, to guide the work of community psychiatrists and one focused on advocacy came together to start to think through what might be key domains of community psychiatric practice that would be most ripe for targeted work relevant to structural racism. Um, and then the, I'd say the final more data evidence driven piece of trying to identify domains that this tool might address uh, included a review of the, re the research literature to draw on uh, particular realms of, of community mental health work, whether that is in, in the workforce, in clinical practice, to identify target issues for which there is an existing evidence based in the literature demonstrating inequity. Um, and we also reviewed existing inequity frameworks, knowing that we certainly are not the first to come to this work and that inequity, quality, quality improvement focused on inequity is certainly something that has been looked at before in healthcare organizations. And so in addition to looking, uh, reviewing the literature for our target issues specific to community mental health, we also reviewed prior uh, frameworks in the literature specifically focused on inequity uh, in order to inform our work as well. Uh, so to say a little bit about some of the, some of the, uh, prod some of the products uh, that we reviewed in coming up with our quality improvement tool, and I will say something that I'll mention in the end is that we do have a publication describing our process for developing this tool that gets into a little more detail of the different equity frameworks that we, re we reviewed and our sense of how those frameworks informed our tool, as well as where we feel where our tool offered something additional as far as gaps existing uh, in terms of a tool that could specifically meet the needs of our membership. Uh, and so I'm not going to go into extensive detail here, but just to review some of the major sort of major frameworks and, and major uh, organizing principles, uh, some that are out there to address inequity in uh, the healthcare space. Um, first, structural competency uh, from Dr. Helena Hansen and Jonathan Metzl, 
uh, structural competency is, a, is an organized framework consisting of five principles, uh, primarily aimed at addressing, uh, ensuring that inequity is infused into the training of healthcare professionals. Um, and so you certainly drew to some degree on this lens in terms of thinking about our framework as addressing key foundational aspects of the organization, uh, the regulation and the structures of our practice in addition to just clinical issues, um, but felt that we still had room to create our own framework for our members uh, in the sense that structural competency, at least as far as we're aware from our view of the literature, has primarily been adapted uh, into training tools for healthcare professionals and perhaps not, perhaps not specifically into a quality improvement tool that could be easily implemented in, into community behavioral health. Another framework that we, uh, we reviewed and considered was the National Standards for Culturally and Linguistically Appropriate Services in Health and Healthcare, or the CLASS standards. Uh, these are 15 standards from the Office of Minority Health uh, aimed towards uh, setting the bar as far as encouraging healthcare organizations to offer culturally and linguistically appropriate services in health and healthcare settings. Um, this, while we felt that the rubric offered here certainly was critical and important to the work that we were doing, Similarly, upon reviewing that framework, we, we still were of the mind that a new tool that we could create could fill a more specific gap in terms of what we were trying to do in the sense that these standards focus primarily on issues of linguistic appropriateness, cultural appropriateness, and perhaps not always broader structural inequity issues. Um, another example of a wonderful framework is the Roadmap to Reduce Disparities from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, you know, this framework certainly, I think, hit a lot of the key elements that we were thinking about as far as a framework and uh, that it offers, offers a very sort of clear six framing principles as well as a variety of implementation tools to help healthcare organizations in a self-directed quality improvement process to address inequity. So very much in line with our thinking as far as what we were trying to develop, uh, where we felt we still had a, a, something that we could add to the literature in spite of the existence of the roadmap to reduce disparities was that some of the elements of that framework don't necessarily hit key issues specific to community behavioral health. Uh, so to give an example, a wonderful aspect of the roadmap to, to reduce disparities is a searchable literature database to assist organizations in identifying issues in the literature that might be relevant to their practice. But we noticed some of the, the, the topics in that literature database didn't necessarily hit all of the clinical issues most specific, say, to individuals with serious mental illness who are kind of a key target audience in community mental health. Um, and then the final example that I want to highlight of other, other um, frameworks that we considered is the research to equip primary care for equity or equip framework. Uh, this framework comes from Canada and has been implemented in the primary care setting with some good outcomes. Um, but similarly, just again, to highlight areas where we felt we still had a, a niche, if you will, to create something new, is that uh, as indicated by the name, this is a tool that was specifically de designed for the primary care setting and is also designed to involve um, paid consultants as part of, the, um, part of the process. And our goal really here was to ideally create a tool that could be used for sort of grassroots self-directed quality improvement in the community mental health space. So to keep going, and I will say, I'll, I'll acknowledge again my colleague, Dr. Ken Minkoff here, and that he is a wonderful guru of quality improvement and, and shared this slide with us as far as some of the initial framing that we had in thinking about the quality improvement process that we hoped that the SMART tool would uh, sort of ideally uh, envision and capture and what sort of what our broad quality improvement mindset was in putting this tool together. Um, and I think the first, the first quote here, the serenity prayer of system change, <laughs> the nod to Ken off as, as this being sort of a little joke, you know, coming off of the serenity prayer, is that I think in coming to this tool, definitely a goal of ours was, was you know, keeping in mind that I think the issue of structural racism can often feel quite overwhelming, that it's so, it so permeates every aspect of society, permeates every aspect of institutions. And you know, as individuals, as organizations thinking about addressing uh, structural racism and doing anti-racism work, that can feel like an overwhelming task. Our goal with this tool was really to create something that would help organizations to sort of focus on that realm uh, where individuals and organizations, I should say, to focus on the realm uh, that they really can change themselves, your own locus of control, if you will. And so we really encourage folks using this tool to think about while you, while you can't change what everyone around, uh, everyone else around you is doing, every program out there that touches your work, what you can hopefully work to change is your own program. And that we hope that this tool is something that can help guide folks through that anti-racism process. 
Um, and then secondly, we really aimed for our tool to follow the accept, sort of widely accepted healthcare quality improvement framework of the FOCUS PDCA cycle. Um, so to sort of break down that acronym, I think many are, are familiar with PDSA, but uh, as far as the FOCUS specifically, this framework encourages healthcare organizations that are considering, pro, uh, considering quality improvement work to first focus on a process to change. Uh, in this case, of course, that would be structural racism to organize a team. Uh, and this is something that is specific in our instructions. Dr. Shienko will be getting into a little more of the detail uh, and nitty gritty of the tool itself. Uh, but our tool aims to, in addition, after you identify the issue, to assist organizations in organizing a team that is going to address that process. Uh, to clarify a baseline, to have a sort of a measurement driven focus in which the baseline behavior or situation of the organization is established first. Again, something that we hope that our tool uh, assists with in terms of its focus on data and focus on trying to take issues that can at times seem somewhat intangible and make them more quantifiable. Uh, to understand the variance, understand where your baseline may not be at, at the goal of where you would like it to be. Um, and so a key part of using this tool is not only measuring and identifying that baseline, but having a group discussion in terms of understanding the, con the contributing factors to that baseline, particularly areas of the organization where those on the team feel uh, things are falling short. And then lastly, to select an issue to address. And so this tool is, we aim to cover a broad array of issues, but we specifically guide organizations upon using the tool to ideally identify a few key areas to attack first in order to make this kind of a more digestible, more um, concrete and more manageable process, thinking about anti-racism focused quality improvement. Um, and so that is sort of the broad QI mindset in addition to the plan, do, check, act, typical change cycle of quality improvement that we use as framing and thinking about putting together this tool and I'd say the, the QI spirit that we hope we catch, captured with this tool in terms of how we hope that it will guide organizations. Next to say a little bit about the rationale for, again, for creating a structural, structured tool. Uh, aside from our finding upon searching the literature that while there are a variety of wonderful frameworks out there, our sense was that there wasn't one that necessarily perfectly fit our niche of meeting the needs of community behavioral health providers. Um, I think, again, to sort of reemphasize uh, something I said a couple of minutes ago, we felt that there is something we sensed ourselves as providers and administrators in the community that we heard from our members is, again, that this issue of anti-racism, even when we boil it down as looking specifically in the community mental health space, can feel at times overwhelming, even a bit intangible because of its pervasiveness. Uh, and so our goal was really to create something that would boil this issue down into actionable information, into a concrete set of domains that organizations can look through and think through as far as addressing areas where inequity might be might very likely be prevalent, prevalent in a community behavioral health organization. Um, we hope that a structured tool helps or will, would help would help programs to you look at organizational processes rather than individuals, but really thinking about structural racism as a fault of organizations at large, rather than something that is targeted to this or that particular individual's behavior. And so our goal with this structured tool was to encourage that mindset and process of looking at an organization globally and thinking as a thinking about a, sort of the more systems level processes and factors that contribute to structural racism in the community behavioral health space. Um, lastly, we felt being data-driven is, is so important as far as QI to give you something, you know, a place to concretely start and a place to get to as far as measurement. And so uh, our mindset in creating a structured tool was to take, again, ideas that at times can feel difficult to quantify and to start to create some sort of process for organizations to concretely have a sense of measurement, both of their baseline across a variety of domains and where there might be areas to move or to improve and also where there may be gaps in data, that, that a goal with, these, with the items in this tool is in addition for organizations to look at, the, look at the items and say, hey, this is exactly where we are, to also notice areas where the case may be, hmm, we haven't thought of this issue before. We don't have any particular data to understand where our baseline is on this issue. And so our goal is to sort of encourage that data-driven process in thinking about uh, the issue of structural racism uh, in community behavioral health. Um, a goal of a structured tool is a tool as well is to, to sort of bring a team together for a group discussion that as much of the activity of this tool as Dr. Shriyanka will share 
uh, shortly is about following this con concrete process of identifying an organization's place across a series of domains, a key part of using this tool is bringing a group together to discuss each domain. That ideally, we hope that there's, there's this process of a team discussing, discussing each domain item by item, coming to a consensus as far as where the organization stands. But a key part of that is the discussion itself, as far as encouraging team members, ideally a diverse array, diverse in terms of identity, as well as diverse in terms of role in the organization to come together and provide their views on where the organization stands on a variety of, of metrics. Um, the thought being that if there's disagreement, that, that is a key thing to bring up as far as whether different people within the organization are seeing and experiencing things differently as far as the organization's progress and performance on issues relevant to structural racism. Um, and then lastly, the piece about score, having a, a structured tool can facilitate scoring, which in, in turn can help uh, an organization come to consensus and have a sense of direction as far as both where we are and where we need to go next and how to prioritize different issues based on a concrete sort of numerical level for each, uh, for each item in, in the tool. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Shoyenka, to take, uh, the, take the attendees step-by-step -step through different aspects of the SMART. Well, uh, it's a, again, it's a pleasure being here with you all. And thank you, Dr. Tally, for that usual masterful um, introduction to the SMART tool. Um, as uh, Rachel just mentioned, I, what I'll be doing is uh, walking through the uh, the different domains of SMART, of, this, of the tool, and uh, um, sharing some thoughts on how this could be made operational in your organizations. I'll also comment a little bit on, um, uh, uh, on the, the rationale behind sharing this, uh, behind focusing on these specific domains. So as you can see, uh, the domains, uh, uh, it, it, part of the process for developing the SMART tool was uh, making based on the on the literature based on the com the feedback from you know the uh, community the WACP board and and membership what areas um uh could serve as a uh, as foci if you will for anti-racism work and necessarily for all the reasons that Rachel has, has already mentioned some of this boil down to a judgment call but if you look at the literature broadly you'll see that each of in each of these areas um uh, uh, independently as well as collectively within an organization. These are some of the um, uh, uh, areas in which there is sufficient uh, evidence to, uh, of disparity to really focus on. So for example, uh, I'll just pick hiring, recruitment, retention, and promotion. The literature is pretty clear on the disparities in hiring and uh, also specifically around promotion for uh, individuals from ethnic minority backgrounds as compared with the uh, uh, with white population. Uh, that's pretty consistent throughout the literature. And that holds true all the way up to the highest levels um, in organizations in the United States, whether it's the, uh, the business world or the not-for-profit world. Similarly, uh, there's abundant evidence in the literature of disparities in clinical care, and I'll just select a couple of um, areas in which uh, the literature is pretty clear. So the use of any kind of restrictive or uh, treatment, whether that is the use of restraints on inpatient settings, use of chemical restraints, physical restraints, uh, the use of um, referral to uh, residential treatment, um, the use of assisted outpatient treatment, you, it's pretty consistent that African Americans in particular and ethnic minorities in general are represented in disproportionately in those settings. And so this is an area that's also ripe for uh, intervention and, the, and similar with the others. The community advocacy uh, piece is a recognition that a necessary role for community psychiatry is uh, really sort of advocating for the well-being of, of our members, particularly when you consider the uh, a triple threat of racism, uh, stigma, and social determinants that many communities served by community psychiatry uh, uh, have to deal with um, in, in the course of navigating treatment. 
and, and similarly with population health outcomes. So these, these areas were selected pretty carefully as places in which you know, there's, there's sufficient evidence um, of disparity consistently, but also uh, areas that fall very, uh, very much into the wheelhouse of uh, community mental health. Next slide, please. So what's the process um, to really uh, uh, um, experience or derive the, the, the greatest benefit from the tool? It's recommended that this not be a top-down process. Now, obviously, uh, SMART could be selected uh, by the leadership of an organization as the you know, chosen pathway to move forward. Uh, but really, in terms of deriving the most benefit, driving the conversations that are necessary, really kind of um, getting a good snapshot and extra of your organization. It's best to draw membership of that uh, steering committee, pilot group, however, whatever you choose to call, call those groups um, from all levels of the organization, as well as from all backgrounds. And that has to be, I think, pretty intentional. intentional. Um, and then the intent is, uh, or the expectation is that as the group, and I will use this term pretty intentionally, struggles through and wrestles through these, you know, uh, the reaching consensus on the scoring, uh, which we'll see how that works in just a few minutes, uh, that this will spark additional conversation on how team members um, how the you know, have experienced the organization with respect to structural racism, as well as you know, how that may manifest in the engagement with the populations that the organization serve. And we're talking here again, specifically about, pop about uh, community mental health settings. Uh, once that process is begun, the expectation is that this is a rolling process. So again, um, just given the nature of structural racism uh, well you know uh, which is tends to morph over time the um, difficulty that really kind of working through this entails it's expected and I think it really should be part of the thinking of the organization that this is a long-term process it's not a one and done it's not a you know um, we've you know got this done, it's done and dusted, it's over. This is a years long uh, process uh, for the organization, which uh, necessarily will have to begin with an action plan that hopefully incorporates some of the findings from the uh, scoring and discussion. Next slide, please. Um, so let's walk through um, a few of these domains. The first here is hiring, recruitment, retention and promotion. I've already mentioned how there's abundant evidence of disparities, and I'll mention one other uh, area, which is discipline, uh, the application of discipline. Um, and there, and there's there are all these other areas: promotion, mentorship, career development, recruitment, hiring, and so on. Um, next slide. So a sample item here is uh, item H1. To what extent? So. Um, this assumes that the work that I mentioned earlier has, had, has already been done by the organization. A group has been pulled together, representative of the organization, diverse from all levels, all, eth all backgrounds, all ethnicities, uh, and so on. So uh, that group could then choose to look at this item, you know, around promotion. So historically, looking at over the past year, number of years, five years, two years, one year, whatever. Um, to what extent does your organization track racial disparities in promotion practices, uh, time to promotion, percentage receiving of employees receiving promotion in a given time period, and to what extent uh, are disparities addressed? And so I think most organizations will have an HR department that has this information that could then go back and look at this and report, you know, and parse that data by, you know, by ethnicity, uh, other uh, um, uh, demographic uh, sort of background information. And then, score, and then the group would score the organization based on data, based on reports. We don't track this. We do track this somewhat 
uh, but have not really begun to address these disparities. We do track this fairly well, have started to work on, uh, on addressing the disparities all the way up to five, which is you know, uh, uh, really having a well uh, refined process that has eliminated disparities and, you know, and where there's actual data to show that. Um, and so that would be a five. And so that, that's the scoring range. Now, how to use this information? Essentially, the group would then document this um, in the, in the um, uh, discussion space on, on the tool and, or, uh, and then uh, note this and then develop an action plan for uh, making progress, however the team uh, defines that progress, whether it's increase the percentages, uh, in, you know, reduce times promotion, you know, or what, however else you define progress. So that's an example in from this uh, first domain. Next slide, please. Uh, clinical care is a big one, obviously. That's our business. The business of medicine is to help people get better. And again, like I mentioned earlier, there's evidence of disparity. And so uh, clozapine access is just one area in which those disparities have been documented, client engagement. Uh, so we know, for example, that the rates of involuntary discharge from treatment are higher for minorities. Uh, social determinants, COVID has given us all an object lesson in how that can impact health outcomes. You know, pretty hard to argue with that, uh, with that data uh, and, and the other areas that we've talked about. And so going to the next slide, um, it, again, the process would be selecting one of these areas under this domain, this clinical domain. For example, access to clozapine. Uh, we know that clozapine is life-saving, pre pre prevents suicide. We also know that it's uh, probably the single most effect effective treatment we have for psychosis, particularly treatment-resistant psychosis. And we also know that for various reasons, there are differences, there are disparities in, in the use of clozaril, despite those known factors. And so the team would sit, sit down again and examine data from the organization's records, as well as um, uh, observations from the team, uh, different members of the team, and then come together to score the performance of the organization around this particular metric. So number one, you know, uh, a one would be, we don't track it. We we haven't, it's not even on our radar. Uh, number three uh, would be, would be we, do, we do this fairly well. Um, we've identified disparities, we're making some progress, um, up, all the way up to number five, which is, again, we track consistently, there are processing, processes in place to ensure that disparities are completely eliminated. Um, and, um, and again, that, that really would come from the team uh, reaching a consensus. Uh, and then developing a plan and a program around improving this, which could be something, for example, like over the next six months, we will um, develop a database uh, that looks at percentages and ensures that um, uh, there's equity around the prescribing of closural in all populations. Next slide. Uh, Workplace culture, um, one of the most difficult ways to uh, areas in which racism, structural racism manifests and uh, uh, really sort of perpetuates disparities is, in, is culture. Uh, as, as Rachel mentioned earlier, very hard to sort of wrap your, wrap your arms around. It's hard to uh, see it. It's kind of like if, if I can use a, an analogy from pop culture for a moment, it's like being in the matrix remember that movie. I was kind of dating myself here, but still one of my favorite movies. Uh, it's like being in the matrix. You, that's all you've ever known. And you know that's just sort of the way we operate. That's how we do business. It takes uh, intentionally unplugging, you know, examining, stepping out, stepping outside of uh, what we're doing to think about it and critically examine it, usually with the help of a tool like this, to really kind of hone in on where the problems are. So um, things like staff to staff conversations, things like addressing microaggressions, which are pervasive, um, things like uh, looking at implicit bias, you know, among staff, things like really uh, respecting and understanding and, and uh, affirming the fact that for many minorities, 
uh, they walk into the workplace with an ex experience of racial based trauma. Uh, and that, uh, frankly, does not commonly, does not often get uh, taken into account or addressed. And then, obviously, addressing for, you know, serious, serious incidents, you know, where there's uh, actions, uh, re, uh, 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 actual incidents, and I'll give you a really common one. Um, there, we, I think, in all organizations, uh, there has there there is the experience that certain individuals refuse treatment by people of uh, ethnic minority background, clinicians, for uh, simply because of racism. Now, the question is, uh, when that gets reported, is there a system for that sort of uh, event? to be tracked, reported, tracked, and addressed. Um, and so that, that's kind of what this is getting at. And then uh, training around structural trauma and racism. Next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, sample item, intentionally, intentional anti-racism workplace culture. To what extent has the organization explicitly identified the goal of creating a safe space in the workplace with staff and clients to be able to identify and discuss racism, racism and its effects, as well as establishing formal processes that's accountable individual structures processes to achieve that goal. And again, it's you know that one to five like at scale uh, for scoring, ranging from really not having done much at all about it, or maybe not even having just begin to think about it, all the way through you know acknowledging that that this would be an important goal but not having really begun work uh, all the way through to identifying uh, and establishing a formal structure and process for addressing. If uh, for organizations that scored themselves a five, congratulations, move on to the next thing. Next slide. Uh, again, community advocacy, I think this, this recognizes that um, um, it's not just, it's not enough. It's particularly when we consider social determinants um, and the trends in broader society around, you know, that really speak to structural racism. The opportunity for community mental health to, uh, to advocate and take a leadership role in redressing uh, some of those trends. Uh, there are these areas that have, that have a significant overlap with behavioral health, behavioral medicine. So uh, we know that, you know, for example, in our city, Philadelphia, um, there is a significant overlap of uh, law enforcement with behavioral health. That's actually all over the country. Um, that's not the case in every country, but certainly the case in the United States. Uh, we know that there is disparity in uh, discipline for children that are ethnic minorities that typically or often lead to um, uh, poor outcomes in terms of incarceration, involvement with the legal system, justice system, and so on. We know the same trends hold true. So there's an opportunity for community mental health to uh, speak to these things. And so that's where this really comes from. Next slide. And, uh, you know, this is another example. To what extent does the organization partner with law enforcement and local justice system to eliminate potential racial disparities in arrest, incarceration, and diversion. Uh, I'll just share one very sort of high level way that this could play out. So take a look at data over the last year. If an organization, for example, runs a, a crisis service. Um, what, per, what percent, if, you, if we broke out populations by ethnicity, uh, broadly white versus broadly minority, what percentage of the minority population ends up coming to, this, to the crisis system in cuffs or um, having been restrained or having had charges pressed against them or having had charges pressed against them post the crisis episode compared with the white population? And that would give some indication because that's obviously heavy, an area of significant overlap with the mental health system. And so that then starts to shed light on, you know, what possible disparities occur. And that's just one example, of course. There are many, many others. Uh, another simple one would be of, you know, the 
you know, individuals served by a population that, that are referred to more intensive levels of care, such as residential treatment for children, what percentage are minorities versus what percentage are, you know, are uh, non, not minorities and why. And so again, it should be this uh, five point Likert scale from, we don't really, we've not even begun to look at this to all the way through, we have developed systems processes to eliminate disparities. And number five, Next slide, please. And uh, health outcomes, including functional health. So this would be society level, population level outcomes, things like uh, employment and housing stability and uh, food, food um, security and so on. Next slide. And even uh, health, health outcomes measured by standardized um, uh, metrics such as the HEDIS measures uh, would be fair game as well. And so uh, sample item, uh, to what extent does your organization track disparities in outcomes such as employment, homelessness, graduation, recidivism, and actually work with the other organs in your system, the other uh, partners in the system to eliminate those disparities. And again, ranging from no actions really, uh, no thought process really around this uh, at, as yet to having developed goals, uh, processes, systems, structures to advance this particular objective. Next slide. So I'll turn this right back to Rachel to take us home. So just to, to wrap things up as far as where we stand with this tool and, and where we hope to go next, and I think in part why we're so excited to have this platform to, to discuss this tool is that First, at this point, as far as the directions that we've taken, the direction that we've taken things since first developing this tool is one, as I mentioned at the top, that we do have a publication in the Community Mental Health Journal uh, describing our process in more detail in terms of developing a tool, in terms of you know including a deeper dive into some of the specific literature that we drew on to uh, to identify key domains as well as prior frameworks that we considered. Um, so we'd encourage for further reading, reading for those interested in the process and the development of the tool and our sort of our mindset and rationale and drawing on both our organization's expertise and the literature to create this, uh, to consider reviewing, uh, taking a look at that publication uh, to get a more, a deeper dive into this process. And then lastly, I think the sort of, if there's one thing that I, I think I could speak for Dr. Shienka and Dr. Minkoff in his absence, that we would love for you to take from this talk is to please consider trying this tool out, particularly if you in, although we design this specifically for community mental health, really we think of it that particularly that there are domains within this tool that could apply in a variety of healthcare settings, but particularly if you're in the community mental health space, we really encourage you to consider piloting this tool in your setting, and most importantly, giving us feedback. Um, I've posted here uh, the place on the website of the American Association for Community Psychiatry, where we have both the smart tool itself posted, but then we also have a, se a, a separate structured feedback tool uh, intent intended to make it very easy for users to give us their sense of what the experience was like. Um, you know, while this tool is, is, as we've described, drawn on the experience of our membership, as well as the research literature and it is sort of our best uh, amalgamation of what we think is most relevant and most useful and helpful as far as addressing these issues. We're very much at this proof of concept stage where we are eager to hear from organizations on the ground. What is it like implementing this tool? What parts work well? Perhaps more importantly, what's challenging about implementing the tool? And if there are ways that we can refine and improve it, improve it to really strengthen um, what we hope is a, is, is a key guiding tool to assist this anti-racism work in the community mental health space. And so we highly encourage those on the call to go to the website, take a look at the tool and consider going through the process of implementing it in your organization uh, and, and lastly, letting us know how it goes. Um, and then lastly, we'll just say that we are share that we are at the stage of in addition to you know, being a part of this webinar, sharing this tool a, with a variety of stakeholders across the country to encourage piloting and early adoption of the tool. Um, and so we are hoping to work through and, and you know, get more formalized feedback as far as the experience and work towards to continuing to develop uh, this tool to promote this work um, in, the, in the healthcare space. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and 
I believe we have some time available perhaps for questions and for comments and, and thank you everyone for your attention. And you all can come off uh, your uh, unmute if you'd like to, if you would like to ask questions that way, or you can put it in the chat, whichever you prefer. Someone asked Rachel, uh, first I want to say thank you, Rachel and Dr. Shanika for uh, this wonderful presentation. I'm Dr. Don Tyus, the principal investigator of the uh, Center of Excellence. So it's a joy to have you. This is some very useful information. And I also challenge individuals to go and check out the tool on your website. One of the participants just asked again, um, Rachel, if you would be so kind and put the post, the link in the chat for the actual tool again. Thank you. Here it is. And also, Ms. Pam, will you please put the um, evaluation link in the chat? Does anyone have any questions, comments? Uh, yeah, is, oops, go ahead, and then I'll go. Hi, this is Steve Denny um, in Kansas. I, I, I'm on the tool right now. I'm just looking at it, and I'm not seeing, I see instructions, but is there a are there specific scoring instructions that gives you like a total score or is it, how does the final scoring process actually work? Or, or is it, or is, is it, or is it not designed that way? That is a great question. So I, so how, so it's, how it's intended is that it, it actually is not so much about say the summative score across domains. So the goal isn't necessarily to, to score each item and then add up that total, but rather just to score each individual item, um, take a look at what the score is on each <clears> item, <throat> and then identify two or three key areas that an organization is most interested in addressing. Um, and also, I think, you know, although I think this isn't explicitly stated in the instructions, of course, the idea is that if, if your collective uh, team in doing this consensus score feels that an item is at, uh, at a level five, I, obviously, that would not necessarily be a key target issue that, that you'd be finding out, okay, this is an area where we're doing well, we're consistently tracking this and addressing it. And that key target issues might be more ones where a consensus team, a consensus team applies the tool and thinks, you know, maybe this organization is more around a one or a two. We're very early in this. We haven't even considered this or we've just started to. And so rather than, rather than a, a sum of the score, it's just about scoring each individual item. And then the team as a whole, looking at the array of items and picking two or three key areas to be the first places to look in developing an action plan to sort of address the, address the baseline. And ideally, of course, make it, you know, move forward and make a little progress up the scale. Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. I think uh, Ms. Nisa had a, had a question. Well, first of all, I, I, I love your guys' presentation. And um, so I'm, I'm Nisa Beatty, Director of Behavioral Health at Venice Family Clinic here in LA. And we are, we have been for the last couple of years diving deeply into our organization and, um, you know, really kind of exploring racism within our organization and right so i'm wondering also if um if you guys are thinking about a tool or something that we can also use with our patients just more widely in terms of their experiences of racism and the traumatic impact um and symptoms related to experiences of discrimination and racism um, cause I've been looking for something like that to use with our patients and I, I really can't find anything that's easily accessible. Are you guys doing anything along those lines? <laughs> I, I will say it again. That is, that is a great, I mean, I, I think a great thought. I, I will say I, as someone who in my, in my life outside of teaching at UPenn, I primarily am clinical in the front lines of community behavioral health. And so I resonate with your feeling as far as uh, there being a real need for a tool of that nature to measure the experience of racism and racial trauma. I work with a pr predominantly minority population and, and similarly have found that to be a gap as far as finding ways to clinically look into these sort of issues and measure them. 
Uh, we ourselves are not in the process of developing such a tool. I, I will say for myself, I won't speak for uh, for Sosumolo that it's simply an issue of bandwidth that this is this tool itself is sort of a labor of love done as part of our volunteer work with this organization. But I mean, I think that is an excellent point as far as a real need and maybe something for the AACP as an organization to consider as, as a future step as far as something that could be useful to community uh, behavioral health providers. There's a question in the chat, um, Dr. Talley, that indicate in your article, do you talk about the process of executing this in an agency? The individual, Ms. Mr. and Mrs. Coleman, uh, were wondering about recruiting staff to have these conversations, how long to give for the conversation, and how to frame the dialogue. Oh, I was gonna say so simple, I think you're muted, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, I would be, um, from the early feedback that we've received, this process looks different for different organizations, uh, depending on the makeup of the organization, depending on where the organization itself is, as far as the anti-racism uh, work uh, within the organization. We just began taking a look at this in my organization, which is a thousand member uh, team, seven divisions, um, of it, reflecting the population of the city of Philadelphia. Uh, we, one organization, uh, I, what I would say is there is significant prep work that needs to happen. And that involves really just creating an environment where it's okay to talk about this, you know, where it's, and, and some of that necessarily has to come from the leadership. Uh, we have received reports of organ, other organizations in which there are grassroots, uh, by that mean, I mean, frontline staff really beginning these conversations and requesting some effort. Um, and again, you know, this is the whole idea behind SMART is to give folks a way to have these conversations in a way that's not threatening, you know, not personalized, not perceived as an attack on an individual, nor even really on the organization, just a way to score where we are and move on. So uh, I, I would say that it, it really needs to begin with a series of discussions, series of conversations uh, to frame the issue, make it okay to talk about this. And then, um, then the process of recruiting staff, you know, is obviously depending on, again, the structure of the organization. Um, the actual application of the tool itself, the process of working through the tool, five domains, you know, obviously many questions can range. You know, um, we've heard at least one organization that has had uh, two, three hour sessions, you know, to just work through the, the uh, portions of the tool. Uh, one other idea, is this is to consider taking you know a, a uh, one piece of the tool and and starting with that so it, it might be clinical work for example where we decide to dig into that and work through work up to the other pieces over time there's also another question from melissa p as an individual who works with a mental health company on a peer level, I am wondering how I can best share this with our mental health team and how to implement this. Thinking I will bring it up in a team meeting and seeing if everyone can engage in this conversation collectively. No harm in sharing the link. <laughs> no harm at all. You can just share the link. And we'd be happy to um, speak with the team. Or you could just share this video, this recording, kind of lays, lays everything out. I agree. And part of why we're so excited to have this recorded session is, is to give a little of the structured guidance of how to use the tool. Um, some future directions we've considered based on feedback we've gotten from some early adopters is even potentially putting together a small FAQ uh, to help those who've attempted to you know, use the tool and, and encounter challenges or pitfalls as far as how to work through the process. Um, but I would just echo yes, and that particularly, I think something that this comment hits on in, in my mind is that I think you know, sometimes tools like this, there can be this top-down mindset of, well, does the, the person at the very top of the organization have to bring this in and be the one who says, this is what we're doing. And that our hope is that a tool like this kind of gives people across an organization, whatever your role, a concrete sort of Thing, a concrete object to bring to an organization 
and, and encourage this process, encourage a process that goes beyond a dialogue and say, you know, hey, we're, we've talked this year, we've talked the talk of addressing this issue. Here is a concrete way that we can actually start walking the walk and taking some real steps to make a change. And so I, I would absolutely agree. Please share the link with, you know, your team meeting. And then again, let, let us know how it went. Let us, let us know what happened because our hope again is to continue to think about how we can build supports around this tool to facilitate its use in these settings and get an understanding of kind of what are the pitfalls or challenges as people in different organizations uh, attempt to implement it, attempt to introduce it to their, uh, to their settings. Um, one of the next question is, how did you integrate the finding from Spitzer, Shohat, and Shein into the development of your tool? That is a great question. I will say, I hope first it's, I wonder if this is something where, where you've had a chance to look at maybe at our publication or, or of course, maybe just reviewed this work yourself. So that was one of the key um, reviews that we took a look at in developing this tool. Um, and I think how we drew on that work was first, it just helped us to get a, a global understanding of the broad array of inequity tools that are out there. Um, just to reference for the rest of the audience, this is a review article that looks at uh, inequity frameworks in the published literature um, and considers sort of their, their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, I would say one way in which that review really informed our process was the thought of uh, needing these tools, like needing a quality improvement tool or needing a framework that really pushes beyond the step of broad key principles and gives concrete guidance around implementation almost at that, that micro step-by-step -step level. But that was certainly, while not something that that review commented on for all of the frameworks listed, certainly noted as far as you know, certain frameworks having a broad, sort of a broad uh, bird's eye view uh, lens for inequity, but maybe not always that concrete guidance of here's exactly how you can sort of walk through getting your organization to meet these milestones, to meet these pillars, to meet the, the, the concept of these frameworks. And so I'd say that's one key way in which we drew, we drew on that framework. Um, I'd say another that simply gave us different ideas of sort of what were key aspects of what should be included in our own framework um, and what did and didn't exist in the, in, in the prior literature. And, and again, I think to emphasize this point of, as, as far as noticing a gap of things, issues unique to community mental health not necessarily being covered in some of the prior frameworks uh, that they reviewed. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, I see a question in there about whether the tool is free. Yes, it's free. Uh, this is Rob Cole. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm from Manhattan, Kansas. And I just want to say, Dr. Shoyinka, it's great to see you again. Um, didn't know where you landed, but it looks like you're doing really great work. Uh, I thought it was a great presentation. And I'm excited to work with a committee we formed about a year ago here at Pawnee to look at those issues. And so I would expect you'll hear more from us. This was a really good presentation. Thank you very much. It's good to see you, Robin. Thank you. And Steve as well, Steve Denny. Are there any more questions for our presenters? Well, again, on behalf of the African-American Behavioral Health Center of Excellence here at Morehouse School of Medicine, we want to thank our presenters for such a wonderful and insightful presentation today. But more than anything, we want to thank you all for being a part of the presentation and being, being here with us today. And until next time, if there aren't any questions, please come back and visit our website within the next few days, and we'll have all of the presentation up on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Talley and Dr. Shanika. I appreciate you all. Thank you so much for having us. We appreciate Thanks for having the, us. The platform. <laughs> you will.